Church Sunday service. Uh, those of you who are joining us online and those of you who are here in person, welcome to all. I'm Dave Burrill. I'll be your liturgist this morning. Um, we have a little, little disjointed uh, announcements. Um, normally when I come in I would get a list of announcements, but uh, this morning I had to uh, kind of take some shorthand notes. <laughs> so if uh, I make an announcement and it's not quite what it should be, please join in. Uh, we'll start with a trustees meeting on Monday uh, at the usual time. I think that is 7, Bernie? Yes. Uh, yes, 7. Uh, that will be this Monday, trustees meeting. Uh, second, I know a little bit about uh, Laurel Walk uh, will be at 7.30 at the parking lot of Tuscan Kitchen is where they'll meet. Uh, all welcome. And uh, anything to add to that? Yeah, and a little rain never hurt anyone. So unless <laughs> it's downpouring, I will be there. Be prepared to walk in any type of weather. Uh, there will be a Bible study on Tuesday. Uh, at the parsonage, and that's uh, 6 to 8. Uh, there will also be a joint worship at St. Luke's. That's on Thursday 
at 6.30 p.m. Uh, Sally would like to remind us about the collecting for uh, the car park, the folks who are living in the, um, I guess it's in the um, rest areas, uh, and that's going to be uh, the food pantry. Uh, this Wednesday they'll be collecting food and items for that. And also, uh, it's the third Wednesday, so it'll be a free lunch. And I'm not sure what that is. Sally, is that here? Yes, yeah, we're going to talk about that. Okay. Uh, are there any other announcements? Bernie? Dave, yeah, just a reminder, uh, we're going to continue to worship in Call Hall for the uh, immediate future until the plastic comes off the windows on the sanctuary so that we get some fresh air. So as far as I know, we'll be back here next Sunday. All right, Bernie wanted to uh, remind us that the until further notice, uh, the meetings will be here at uh, call, uh, Sunday services will be here at Call Hall. Are there any other announcements? All right, seeing none, so we'll go to our opening prayer or our call to worship. Sorry, I'm, I'm almost organized. <laughs> Praise the Lord and sing to the Lord a new song. Let's lift our voices and just praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice in God their Maker, and let all the children be filled with joy. Let's lift our hands and just praise the Lord. Praise the Lord with dancing and singing, timbrels and harps. Let's lift our souls and just praise the Lord. Let the saints of God be joyful, and let them sing aloud all the day long. Let's lift our songs and just praise the Lord. Let there be high praise to God in our mouth and on our lips. Let's lift our shouts and just praise the Lord. Praise God for mighty deeds of justice, righteousness, and honor. Let's, Let's just, just praise the Lord. Lord. Thank you. to you, and you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desire and petition, as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth, and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Our opening hymn is He Has Made Me Glad. It's in your faith we sing, number 2270.
Good morning, everybody. You may be seated. It is a joy to be here again this Sunday, even if it's a little rainy. <laughs> I'd say we need the rain, but I mean, we do need the rain, but it has been rainy all week. But it's better than hot and humid, I think. But maybe not. Uh, so now we come to our time of joys and concerns. Um, again, I will start. It's a joy to be here again, leading things this Sunday. I will be happy to not do it next Sunday. I'm just saying. <laughs> <laughs> Planning two weeks in a row is a challenge sometimes, but it's fine. I'm here. I'm happy. I'm happy to see all of you this morning. Are there other joys and concerns this morning? Jane. It was a joy to have three weeks vacation in Wisconsin, <laughs> and it's a joy to be back here this morning. Uh, Shane Chen, it was a joy to have three weeks vacation and spending that in Wisconsin. Glad that you enjoyed it. It was lovely, and I can't wait to hear more about it after service. Are there others this morning? So Barbara sharing a joy and a concern, a joy that her grandson and wife are expecting, so a joy that she will be a great grandmother, which is very exciting, but then also a concern because once the baby is born, she will need surgery, so just prayers that all goes well there, prayers for mom to be healthy, baby girl to be healthy, and for the doctors to do what they need to do to keep everybody healthy and safe. Are there others this morning? Just a joy to have you and Jeff here filling in. Um, it's a blessing for me because you're up there, so. Uh, <laughs> <I'm happy. laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, and it concerned my brother in law, Chris, my um, sister's husband, is going in for an MRI. They found a growth um, in his prostate, and he is very concerned. So, prayers that it will be benign and all will be well. Uh, Diane lifting up a blessing that it's myself and Jeff up here today and not her, so take some pressure <laughs> off of her. I think I can speak for Jeff too. We're happy to do it and be here. Uh, and then also a concern for her brother-in-law, Chris, who is having an MRI because he has a growth near his prostate, so hoping that everything goes well and that it's benign and nothing to really worry about. I see Sally. I was just going to mention another joy in that I took I took a sort of last minute trip down to Maryland for last weekend and everything's just turned out really well, despite you know, Hurricane Debbie and all the aftermath and stuff. It was just it was just so fun to see as many people as I saw. Uh, so Sally sharing, hey, you know, God is the best. Uh, Sally sharing that she took a last minute trip to Maryland this past week and that despite all the aftermath of Hurricane Debbie and just all the things, that everything was amazing and just perfect and she enjoyed every second of it. I love that. Connie? So, a joy. Um, Andy and I just came back from a really nice trip to the Finger Lakes. And among other, uh, many of the sites we saw, we went to the um, Women's Rights National Park in Senator Falls and come to find out that first um, women's rights convention was held in the Wesleyan Methodist Chapel in Seneca Falls and it's part of the National Historic Site and we got to go and hear a really good talk about the, the whole history behind all that but it was a joy being in this, this Methodist Chapel they were the ones that opened it up for the welcoming arms for this first 
So Connie's sharing that she and Andy are back from the Finger Lakes and they had a fabulous time. And one of, I'll say the many things that they learned about was that in Seneca Falls, the women's right movement really started there. And I don't think any of us should really be surprised by this. It was the Wesley United Methodist Chapel that welcomed those ladies in to start this movement. And Connie and Andy got to be there and listen to some things and learn some things. So pretty neat stuff. Um, and then I will share some updates from last week for myself. Uh, my Uncle Chris uh, had his back and neck surgery. He was in ICU for most of the week last week, but in between leaving here and getting to St. Luke's for service yesterday, my mom had texted saying that they moved him to rehab yet last Sunday, um, which is phenomenal, and he is much more himself this past week. He is back to being his sarcastic, joking self with the <laughs> staff there. Um, you know, still trying to get some of his strength back after a major surgery like that, but he is on the mend, and they're hoping that this week may potentially be his last week in rehab and that he can go home after that. So just continued prayers of healing for my uncle. And again, my aunt, because as I shared last week, my aunt fell on her last day of work when she retired and she oh. broke her nose on both sides of her face. She dislocated her finger on one of her hands. So last I knew she was in a cast still kind of up to her elbow because of her hand healing but to her ankle. Thankfully, she doesn't need surgery of any kind, like her airways are not damaged, so that is a positive. And even though she's probably stressed about my uncle, this has given her some time to focus on her healing since he's not home and she's not having to be the caregiver yet, but that time is coming. So just prayers that she continues to heal and can help him and all the things. Um, and then just continued prayers for my grandmother, who is rapidly declining still, and, you know, none of us know when or how long we have left. So just prayers that her last weeks, months, days, whatever it is, can be as pain-free as possible, and that we can kind of hold her as a family in that space and make it, make her transition as good as possible. There are others this morning. If not, let us be in an attitude of prayer with our prayer hymn, O oh Lord, hear my prayer. Loving God, friend of the neglected and the despised folk, friend also of the cherished and honored ones, we offer to you our prayers for this world which Christ 
gave his all. We pray for the overthrow of the arrogant and cruel and for discontent in the souls of the greedy and the careless. We pray for the uplifting of the meek and merciful and for the encouragement of the poor and pure. We pray for the recovery of the bruised and the lost and the peace of those who thirst for righteousness. We pray for those who need healing, who are facing medical tests this week. Be with them in their moment of weakness and being afraid. Give them peace to know that you are always there. We pray for the feeding of the hungry in body or spirit, and for the healing of those who are diseased in body or mind. We pray for the comfort, comfort of the suffering and the grieving, and for the befriending of the lonely, timid, or socially awkward people. We pray for the humbling of the church if it becomes proud, and for courage wherever it is shunned or persecuted. We pray for the strong and the weak in this congregation, and for the spiritual health of all other churches in the community. And we lift up the joys that were shared today, the memories that were made on travel journeys and reconnecting with people, learning new things about new places and general curiosity about the things around us. You, holy friend, are more eager to give than we are to receive. Deal firmly with your servants gathered here now, that we get rid of everything that clutters our souls and make way for all the new blessings you have in store for us. And now, with the confidence of children, let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. First scripture reading this morning is taken from Exodus chapter 12, verses 1 through 14. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be your beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year for you. Tell all the congregations of Israel that on the tenth day of the month they shall take every man a lamb according to their father's house a lamb for a household. And if the household is too small for a lamb, then a man and his neighbor next to his house shall take according to the number of persons. According to what each can eat, you shall make your count for the lamb. Your lamb shall be without blemish, a male, a year old. You shall take it from the sheep or from the goats, and you shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the month, 
when the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill their lamb in the evening. Then they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorstops and the lintel of the houses in which they eat them. They shall eat the flesh that night, roasted with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. They shall eat it. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled with water, but roasted, its head with its legs and its inner parts. And you shall let none of it remain until the morning. Anything that remains until the morning, you shall burn. In this manner you shall eat it. Your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover, for I will pass through the land of Egypt that night, and I will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and in all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and no plague shall fall upon you to destroy you when I smite the land of Egypt. This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations, you shall observe it as an ordinance forever. Our second reading is Psalm 149. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song. His praise in the assembly of the faithful. Let Israel be glad in his maker. Let the sons of Zion rejoice in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing. Make melody to him with timbrel and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people. He adorns the humble with victory. Let the faithful exalt in glory. Let them sing for a joy on their couches. Let the high praise of God be in their throats and two-edged swords in their hands to wreak vengeance on the nations and chastisement on the peoples, to bind their king with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute on them the judgment written. This is glory for all his faithful ones. Praise the Lord. Please stand as you are able for the gospel reading. This morning's gospel is taken from Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, Take one or two others along with you, that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. May God add his blessing to these readings. Amen. Amen. with the reading that I chose from Matthew this week. There were parts of this reading that made me really uncomfortable. 
for gold. This whole passage is really about conflict and attempting to resolve that conflict. For me personally, I know that I do not like conflict. In fact, I try to avoid it as much as I possibly can. Yeah, and I know that's probably not the most realistic view on that. Um, and it's probably not really too healthy to avoid conflict either. But who here can say that they really enjoy conflict? Pretty sure no one. <laughs> um, I mean, again, I think that I can confidently say that no one here wakes up in the morning and says, hmm, let's see who I can argue with today. That will be fun. However, as we all know, there are times when conflict is unavoidable. This happens in all kinds of settings. You can be in conflict, conflict with your spouse or significant other, friends, family, coworkers, people at church, even your family pet. <laughs> the point is that no matter how much we try to avoid it, conflict is going to happen. It's just part of life. We all know that there are many different ways to disagree with someone. And we all have different tactics when we are having an argument with someone. As is true with most things in life, some of these tactics and coping mechanisms are better than others. When you are in conflict with someone, emotions are usually heightened and can also be kind of all over the place. I know that I very rarely am acting rational when I'm in the middle of an argument. When my husband Andy and I are having an argument, um, most times we tend to get off topic and start arguing about something completely different than whatever we started out bickering about. Um, and nine times out of ten, these arguments are about something really pretty silly and insignificant. And by the time the argument ends, we usually don't even remember what we were actually fighting about in the first place. Sometimes it's a huge thing, sometimes it's not. Sometimes the argument is not even about like what the real problem is. It's just this one thing happened that made one of us see right more like, oh, why'd you do this thing? And then the argument ensues. However, I will say, after we have both had time to cool off, go to our separate corners, as it were, we have a chance to breathe and collect our thoughts, figure out like what the root of the problem was that caused the argument, and then we come back and we tend to try to talk about what happened. And there is so much clarity about each other gained in those moments. I mean, I will say most recently we kind of had an argument about my potential going back to school. And it wasn't even that he was upset about that. He felt like I hadn't included him in the decision-making process, which was something I didn't know that he needed. <laughs> so that's what I said. I'm like, how did I know you needed this thing if you didn't tell me? But had we not had that argument, I wouldn't have known that that was what he needed. As I'm sure a lot of you with significant others have incidents, I'll say, like that, where the thing is not the thing. Anyway, I digress a little bit. And again, sometimes this works great. Uh, we can figure out what the real issue is. Sometimes, not so much. And neither one of us still have any idea what we were actually fighting about. And unfortunately, Neither my husband nor I are perfect. I know that's probably a shock to everybody. So there will be times when our fight is just a fight for literally no apparent reason other than just because. So we know that most of us really do not like to be in conflict. And we know that even though we try to avoid it, we really can't. It is just part of life. And we also know that most of us probably do not handle being in conflict as well as we think we do. 
What can we do about that? How do we try and approach resolving conflict in a way that is pleasing and possibly beneficial to all parties involved? Right now, you might be saying or thinking something like, oh, April, conflict is so uncomfortable. There is no possible way that I will ever feel comfortable with conflict. conflict. I am even more uncomfortable with trying to resolve conflict. And you might also be thinking that there is absolutely no way to resolve a conflict that is beneficial and pleasing to all parties. Someone always has to lose in a conflict. What if I told you that there is a way to resolve a conflict that attempts to make things not so awkward for all parties involved? What if I told you that there are just a few fairly simple steps to attempting to resolve almost any type of conflict? And what if I told you these resolution steps were somewhat easy to follow? Now for the biggest aha, what if I told you that this guide to conflict resolution can be found in the Bible? Now you might be thinking, wait a hot minute. You mean to tell me that the Bible tells us how to resolve conflict? Yep, that's exactly what I'm saying. In fact, Jesus gives us some pretty clear steps on how we are to go about resolving conflict. In Matthew 8, sorry, Matthew 18, verse 15, Jesus says, If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. In this verse, Jesus is telling us that we must confront the person who we are in conflict with. We must open up a dialogue with this person. We must communicate with this person about why we're mad at them, or reverse, why they're mad at us. The goal here is to have a conversation with the person who we are in conflict with. Communication in these situations is key. This gives each party the opportunity to try and work out their differences. If you are able to have a productive conversation with the other person and are able to work out your differences, then there's no need for further resolution. You've already done it. Of course, we all know that sometimes simply talking it out does not work. The person that you are fighting with is just not listening, or you're not listening, or a combination of all the things. But don't worry, Jesus has already laid out what the next step should be in resolving conflict. So what exactly is this next step in conflict resolution that Jesus had laid out for us? In Matthew 18, verses 16 through 17, it says, but if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you, that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, Tell it to the church. And the first step that comes from verse 15, Jesus is telling us to try and resolve the conflict on our own with the other person. However, we know that sometimes conflict can't be resolved by trying to talk it out. This is where the next step comes into play. What Jesus is saying here is that if the first step has failed, you must bring in a few other people. Sometimes this works, and sometimes it doesn't. And I think what Jesus is trying to tell us here is that it can be helpful to have a few other impartial people there to try and help resolve the conflict between the two parties. Because when you're on the outside looking in, you can see things that the people involved can't. And again, we all know that finding resolution when you are fighting this with someone is not necessarily made easier by introducing more people. However, Jesus goes on to tell us what to do if the person we are in conflict with is still not listening, or we can't come to a resolution that works for both parties. If, after trying to use steps one and two to resolve this conflict still isn't working, 
Jesus tells us to take it to the church. I'll admit, when I first read this, I was like, take it to the church? Really? But the more I thought about it, the more it started to make sense. The thing that is important to remember here about being told to take it to the church is the time and when this was written. At that time that this was all taking place, the church, or really more like the synagogue, was the place to go for all of your issues. After all, the Sanhedrin was the Jewish court of the day. In fact, I believe that it probably still is today in some function. My point here is that people of this time often went to their local synagogue when they had an issue that couldn't be resolved. So in this context, it makes sense to take it to the church. If, after following steps one and two, your conflict is still not resolved. In today's society here in America, I don't think that our first thought would be to take it to the church when we are trying to resolve conflicts with someone. I think, and of course, it depends on the type of conflict you're having, that we would take it to a loved one, a boss if it's in the workplace, maybe even the police, depending on the severity of the conflict. I don't think any of us would immediately think that we should take this particular issue to the church. Although, this now poses an interesting question. What would happen if we were to take our conflict or fight with someone to the church? Would the resolution become more grace-filled? Would we have a sense of what Jesus wants us to do to resolve this conflict with the other person? However, this is a whole other conversation for a whole other day for a whole other sermon. So at this point in our attempt to resolve this conflict we are having, we have gone through the first three or four steps. Nothing has been resolved yet. This is even after bringing it to the church. So now what do we do? The next part of verse 17 says, And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. I don't know about you, but this line does not sit well with me at all. In fact, this is the part of the reading that I have been struggling the most with this week. This line just makes me feel so uncomfortable. Jesus was friend to all peoples, especially the tax collectors and the Gentiles. I mean, Matthew was a tax collector. And we all know that Gentiles and tax collectors were not treated very well at this time in history. So, why would Jesus tell us to treat the person that we are in conflict with like a Gentile or a tax collector if we have not been able to resolve our conflict up until this point? This just seems so off-brand for what Jesus was teaching and preaching. Jesus is love. This line does not sound like love to me. If we pause for a minute and think about this line, instead of just reacting to it, we might be able to have an idea of what Jesus meant here. How did Jesus treat the tax collectors of the day? Did he treat them like everyone else? Did he look down on them? Did he cast them out and not include them? Of course, we know the answer to these questions is a resounding no. As I already said, Matthew was a tax collector and Jesus called him. So, what if we are not to take this line literally? What if we stop and think about the fact that this is Jesus speaking? Maybe what he is saying here is to treat the person that you are in conflict with you, and that is you with a capital Y, meaning God, would treat a Gentile or a tax collector. Does this change the meaning of this statement for you? I think what Jesus is trying to say here 
as, is that if all the steps to resolve the conflict have failed up until this point, we need to treat the person that we are in conflict with with love and kindness. That seems like a much better option to me. This last part of verse 17 is still an uncomfortable statement. For me, this whole passage is quite uncomfortable. However, with this last part of verse 17, it feels like the turning point of this verse. And what I mean by that is, it feels like the start of finding some type of resolution. In verses 18 and 19, it says, Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you, if you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. Basically, what these two verses are saying is that the things you do here on earth will follow you into heaven. Do you want to be with, in conflict with someone for eternity? I think that most of us want to just shout a resounding no. I mean, who really likes being in conflict anyway? I know that I sure don't. I think what this part of the verse is saying to us is something along the lines of, is it really worth your time and energy to continue to be in conflict with this person? I'd like to think that at this point in the conflict, both sides would just sigh and say no. Maybe this would open up the opportunity to have some type of dialogue about what the real issue is. Maybe it would give the opportunity for each side to really listen to the other. Sometimes when we, li sometimes when we listen without any preconceived notions, we hear something that we wouldn't have heard before. Maybe this presents the opportunity to open, about, open up about something deeper than what might be going on in the relationship of the two people in conflict. Maybe, just maybe, this part of conflict resolution process that Jesus has given us starts to bring in healing. There's still one more thing that Jesus has to say about this whole conflict resolution process. Personally, I think that this is the most powerful statement in the whole passage. In verse 20, Jesus says, For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Let's listen to that one more time. For where two or three are gathered, in my name, there am I among them. After having such a hard time with this passage this week, this last line just feels like all of the turmoil of this passage has been calmed. When I first read this passage, I was immediately like, oh, there's the Jesus I know. I immediately felt a little bit better about this particular passage just being uncomfortable. For me, it was like the light bulb going off kind of moment. And what I mean is that Jesus is telling us that he is with us this whole time. We will always have moments of conflict or feelings of being uncomfortable in a situation with someone else. And yes, sometimes we'll be able to resolve those issues or conflicts pretty quickly and easily. However, there will be times when there is just no good way to solve the issue or conflict. Even if we try to follow these steps that Jesus has laid out for us, they will not always work. Both sides may be caught up in the reason why they are angry with the other. Sometimes we won't be able to really listen to what the other person is saying. Sometimes, we might not even be able to resolve the issue or conflict. And you know what? It's fine. It's totally okay. It's okay because Jesus makes it okay. He is always with us. 
And not just in the good times in our lives, always. He is always with us. As humans, we tend to lose sight of that even when we are going through hard things. Sometimes we ask, Jesus, where are you? His answer is simple. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Our next hymn is number 131, We Gather Together in the United Methodist Hymn.
of love and compassion, we ask you to dedicate the tithes and offerings we bring to worship. We do this in the hope that you will do more with them than we could ever do on our own to heal the brokenness and division in our world. Remind us that the work of reconciliation does not get removed from our list because we put something in the offering and that the mission field is within arm's reach. This we pray in the Redeemer's holy name, Jesus the Christ, amen. And our last hymn today is number 2223 in the faith we sing, they'll know we are Christians by our love. Thank you. 